This is The Wheel Weaves, a Wheel of Time podcast with no spoilers. Welcome listeners, this podcast is safe for first-time readers because it's made by a first-time reader. I'm your host, Annie, and I'm the one who's taken on the task of reading through this 15-book megaseries. I'm joined by my co-host, Brett, who's a longtime fan, and he's acting as my tour guide on this journey. Before we get into our episode today, we just want to welcome Jordan Martins to the Wheel Weaves Patreon team. We really want to thank you for your support and your generous contributions. This episode, we're going to be talking about chapters 48 and 49. Yeah, so we have The Blight and then The Dark One Stirs. Yes. So. Very exciting. And lots to cover. Yeah, and I was just excited to be able to read two chapters. Yeah. That's always fun for me. We're so close to the end now. Yeah. Like final stretch. Yeah, home stretch. Yeah. We're round in third. Yeah. <laughs> You're really good at sports other, metaphors. Other baseball terms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Third down and nope. one to go. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Shoot the hoop at the at the buzzer. <laughs> <laughs> so let me kick it off with a fun fact and then we'll get into the chapters. Cool. Sounds good. So today's fun fact is a question that was posed to Harriet, and someone asked her, who was Robert Jordan most like? Oh, like character-wise. Character-wise, yeah. Now, unfortunately, I'm going to give you the answer, but I'm not going to extrapolate on this. I'm going to get you to give your opinions on it. Okay. Yeah. First, do you want to take a guess what her answer was? Who was Robert Jordan most like? Yeah. I hope it's like Nynaeve. Okay. <laughs> Is that your Sassy final answer? Sassy know-it-all, Robert Jordan. <laughs> That's your final answer? That's my joke answer. Okay. Because I don't have a real one. Okay. I want to say Rand because when you write a main character, you typically... Sure. Can might... connect with that main character. Yeah. I can see that. I doubt that's what it actually is, but... Yeah. I'll spoil... It's not Rand. Yeah. But the answer is Perrin and Matt. Oh, yeah. Perrin. Yeah. So it's kind of a funny combination. Because yeah, he had a beard. He was like hairy. Sure. I mean, you could go physical characteristics with this. Right. Oh, that's not what they're talking about. Probably more like character <laughs> development wise, but. Okay. And that was Harriet's opinion. Yeah. Harriet's opinion about who Robert Jordan was most like. Okay. So it's a mixture. Marin. <laughs> that's their couple name. Or Pat. No, I like Marin better. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's get into chapter 48. The Blight. The Blight. And we have a new chapter symbol. Yeah. I call it New Spooky Tree. Okay. I called it Withered Tree. Oh. Yeah. But it's very close to the other tree with a full moon that we've seen. Except it's droopy. It's like withered. And spooky. Spooky. And there's like a drop of something hanging off one of the branches. Yeah, it's creepy. Yes. So I think it's pretty clear that it's like a blight tree because we learn all about the blight this chapter. Yeah. We learn about how the vegetation is definitely droopy evil yeah <laughs> it's it's tainted with e corrupted yeah by evil we and definitely learn that this chapter and then next chapter we actually really get into we, some yeah, tainty blighty trees yeah yeah okay so last time we left off with our crew needing to rest up before their big journey into the blight. And we also got a whole bunch of information about what a dick, dark friend Pat and Fane is. Yes. Like you, crazy monster asshole. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. That's like worse than a dark friend. That guy is yeah. seriously the worst. Yeah. He's bad. And my dark friend symbol... Remember when I went back and had this thought about the dark friend symbol being on the peddler chapter? Oh yeah, I remember because I asked you, what are you implying? Yeah. And you said nothing yet. Yes, Yeah. I know. Because you do this thing where you make a face that throws me right up and I can't read you. I can't tell if it's because I'm right on track or because it's You're the so stupidest base, thing yeah. I've ever said yeah so i kind of hit this point in the middle where i'm like i don't know yeah. but i found it and i caught it and i do find it interesting and it definitely makes me think about those symbols even more yeah and it's really funny because that's why i always say the first thing you want to do after you finish reading the wheel of time is reread is re -read it because when you go back through you're like oh man they're so yeah. good like right at the first the like first couple chapters he snuck that in there for you yeah so hmm yeah. Very interesting. And especially if 
if you're listening to like the audiobooks and you don't get those chapter symbols yes. or icons or whatever they're called, yeah. you miss that completely. And it's, it's very cool. And also something I wish that I had taken more note of was the chapter titles. Yeah. Because okay. there is a chapter called What Follows in the Ways or What Follows in Darkness or something. Sure. And that's the chapter 45 that I just edited and released. Okay. And that is the chapter where Lan says someone or something is following us. And it's a very small part in the chapter, and you just sort of think it's the Black Wind, but the chapter title is called What Follows in Darkness. Yeah. And it's like, Pat and Fane is following you in the darkness. And yeah, it's like he got you. very pointed, <laughs> but I just didn't even think to go back and think about what the chapter title could mean. Yeah, and it's very unique to this series that you get the chapter symbol and the chapter title and all the little hints. Yeah. Some Fun. of them yeah. don't mean as much, I think, but some mean a lot. Yes, and that's that's the hard part. Yeah. Okay, so let's get going here because they are off. First thing in the morning with Ingtar? Yes, Ingtar. Okay. And a hundred lanced men escorting them to the border. And Lan is in his invisibility water cloak because he's cool like that. Yep. And as they reach the border, Ran notes that tall guard towers are all there and there is at least half a page describing these towers. Yeah, so the important information is there are guard towers that are bordering the border. Yeah, of the borderlands. (laughs) Of the borderlands. Bordering the border of the borderlands. (laughs) Yeah, but I mean, it makes sense. There's watchtowers. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and they're pretty cool, but lots of description about these towers. You know what's really funny, though? What? Is that last chapter, we got all this mention about Maureen shutting down Agelmar about sending men. Yeah. And she was like adamant, no, 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 no. Yeah. Not happening. And then what do we see first thing? Hundred lances. And Ingtar. And Ingtar. So you have but to only imagine. to the border. And I just have to, in my brain, imagine that Maureen like just settled on that. Because he was being so up. annoying yeah. about it. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, fine, they can, they can take us to the border. But after that, we're done. Yeah, so. exactly. But Ingtar doesn't like that. He no. wishes that he either could go with them or not go at all. Because escorting them to the border, apparently he's just been commanded to go and do this and go no further. And he's super pissed about it. He's going to miss all the good fighting at the Gap. Yeah. So he's like between two, you know, bad places. Yeah. He wants to fight. Yeah. And we got a hint of that too last couple of chapters where he was like, this is who I am. This is why I exist. Right. Is to and fight. I kind of have a little bit of a note about this. Because I think that this fight at the Gap happened very fast. Our crew showed up yesterday, and today, all of the people in Faldara are going to fight this battle. Sure. Are going out. So, do things like this happen all the time? Where they're just constantly going out to the Gap to fight and sending people away and they all come back? Sure. Or were they waiting for like land to show up because they put out, quote, a call? Yeah. And they're waiting for hopefully reinforcements to show up. And then they sort of found out that he's here, but he's not coming to help. So they've just decided to go. Is it all a big coincidence? Like they were always going to go tomorrow and it's good luck that they showed up today. This is a really, really, really important point because... This book so far has been written from a very narrow point of view of a bunch of country bumpkins who don't know anything about the world. Right. And why that's important is because the note, the mention you make about is it just coincidence or like, why are they going today? Yeah. It's kind of odd, but you have to think about what's been going on in the world for the last, you'd have to assume weeks, months. Yes. And... I would assume that this call, because we know that Egelmar had sent out a call to different places, at least to Morin and Lan, and he sent out notices to the other Borderland nations for assistance, and he has not received help from anyone. Kind of mirrored in like the Manetheran story. Yeah. A little bit. Help like, doesn't come. Help doesn't come. But yeah. that's the big thing. So I would have to assume they've been planning this for a while now, and that's the question I was going to ask you is... We know that the Borderland nations haven't sent help because they're afraid that their nations are going to be attacked. Yeah, and everything's just going to collapse and fall. But if you assume that Agelmar and Shinar sent out, you know, calls for help to other factions, other countries, other nations, like Tarvalin, which isn't that far away, 
why has no one shown up? They seem so excited that Lan is here. Yeah. Like, I would have to assume that Shinar called for help from Tar Valen, and no one from Tar Valen's shown up either. Hmm. Well, they're busy. Sure. With the false dragon and everything. That's true. They got other things to worry about than like the world falling or the borderlands falling. Yeah. But if you think about that, like the one nation of borderland falling Mm -hmm. because Egelmar is adamant that they are outnumbered 10 to 1. Yes. They're going to lose. They're evacuating the city. Like this seems like Shinar is going to fall. Yeah. Well, it's very reminiscent of what's actually happening in our world. Yeah. It's a sheltered universe they all live in. Yeah. And... You know, we are fortunate enough to live in a place where we don't see war. That's true. And stuff, right? You, We hear about it, but we, we, read go, about it. we yeah. go along with our lives and we don't, you know, necessarily take it as seriously as we could or should. And I'm sure this happened or maybe Robert Jordan even felt this going because he fought in a war yeah. and came back yeah. and probably interacted with people who didn't take it very seriously and well we're so far removed whatever, it's right? not a reality for us well and that's exactly it right maybe that's the issue with the rest of the world it's a reality for the people who live in the borderlands and yeah. shinar but for everybody else it's like wow they always ask for help yeah. they're fine like people in right. camelin right people further south who don't even think trollocs and fades exist like right. they're so far removed yeah so it's just it kind of ties into the whole picture that yes we've seen a very narrow point of view of the world because it's just from mostly Rand's perspective. Yeah. But what's actually happening in the world is so much more severe than what we've seen. I think that their decision to leave, you know, first thing tomorrow, I think that happened because Lan and Moraine showed up and aren't going to help them. Yeah. So they assume that no help is coming. That's from what anyone. I think. So I don't think sense. it's a complete coincidence that they show up today and tomorrow they are planning on leaving anyway. I think they were waiting and hoping and maybe they had like a timeline or a deadline and we're like, okay, if we don't hear by now, we'll leave. But then this really confirms it, them showing up. So and they're that, not coming to help. And so. they're all ready to go. Yeah. It's not like they're not ready to fight whenever. So it was probably like, well, no help's coming. If we were going to get help from anyone, it was these guys and they're not here. So let's just go. Yeah. No, I agree. They could have waited for Ingtar, <laughs> in my opinion, because... He is going to ride back as hard as he can yeah. from there. But also, Ingtar might be a little bit of a complainy pants here. Right. Well, where I'm going to go where I'm allowed to fight. Yeah, he's a little bit dramatic here. Yes, but he's mad. Like, this is like everything he knows and everything he wants to do. And he's following orders, but he's mad about it. Yeah, complainy pants. <laughs> yeah. But hopefully, maybe he will make it in time to fight any Trollocs. Yeah, and it's like, yeah, man, you're going to make it at yeah. some point. Yeah, and Nynaeve just sort of wants to know why he's so eager to fight. And he just says, like, it's a different way of life. It's what he's been trained to do. It's what he does. Yeah. We get a bit of a flashback here next to what happened this morning when they were leaving. So when they went to take off, Faldara's gates opened at dawn with Lord Agelmar leading all the soldiers and the fighters to the east and then eventually north. Yep. Some other people will also join them from other nations? Not other nations, other cities within Shinar. Okay. So it's like they're doing a big snake to collect all the troops and then they're heading to Tarwood. Gotcha. Again. Okay, that yeah. makes sense. And then all the farmers and townspeople head south to Fall Moran. Yep. The, the capital. capital. Yep. And our crew headed out the Malkier, Malkier? Yeah, Malkier. Gate. And a handful of soldiers and older men stay behind because Faldara will never fall undefended. Yeah, so they just want to leave a sprinkling of soldiers just so that it's not completely empty. Right. So that was a quick flashback because now we're back. Yep. To our crew. And we're back. Yep. Yep. And it's about an hour past the guard towers and nothing has really happened and the land doesn't really change. And Rand keeps wondering, when are they going to reach the Blight? And I just thought all the northern land above the borderlands are just the Blight. So Yeah, it's a, but this is the thing. Rand doesn't know anything and it, the Blight is a slow progression. Yeah. Like, and we really get that. Yeah. yeah. They're in the Blight from the moment they pass those watchtowers. Yeah, okay. But then he's like, when are we going to get to the Blight? Yeah. And it's like, you're in the Blight. You're in the Blight. It's just going to get progressively worse as right. you go further. Okay. So 
we start to get note of this because it starts to get warmer. And Egwene is completely oblivious and it's like, oh, the weather's lovely here. Yeah. And But this is what Lan told them what happened. The blight is hot. It will be warm in the blight. And he said, because basically they were complaining about how cold it was. Yeah. Turns out no one listens. No surprise there. Yeah, that's not new information. No. So. Welcome to this book, <laughs> basically. Nynaeve thinks that it feels wrong, though. And Ran nods and can feel it, too. I wanted to ask if you were going to read anything into that. Of course. Okay. I got a bolded note here. Okay. Of course I'm reading into that. Sure. So if Nynaeve is feeling that something's off. Okay. Is that like her nature sense going off? What do like you mean how, nature sense? Well, how she can like listen to the wind in quotations. Well, her listening to the wind has to do with the one power. Yeah. So I would say that whatever power she does have has to do with being able to touch a true source, being able to channel the power... And if Nynaeve can feel it and Ran notes he can feel it too, it's because he can channel the power. Okay. All right. Yeah. No, that's that's good. Yeah. But it also reminds me of when Perrin could smell that the white cloak smelled wrong. Okay. And couldn't really explain what that meant. He's like, oh, they smell wrong. So it it's smells more, different. Yeah, more feeling. Right. And now it's like, oh, this place feels wrong, but you can't really explain it. Okay. It's a, it was just a parallel that it reminded me of that. Yeah, it, it kind of feels like a gut intuition a lot of the time. Yes. Like they're picking up on something, they're not really sure why. Yeah, but, but I do think it has to do with the taint and the dark one and the power. Okay, all interconnected. Yes. Cool. So the longer they travel, the hotter it gets, and they start to notice that it also feels damp, kind of like they're in a swamp, and it's like boggy. And we also get mentioned here that Matt is still wearing the scarf around his head. Yeah. And I'd forgotten about that. Yeah, he's done that since the lightning strike yeah, at Fort Yeah, there's been no mention of it, of him wearing that, since he's been healed. Okay. Well, I that, think that I didn't notice anyway. Yeah, that so wasn't I, too long ago. Though. It, that was like that's three That's true. Days. I know. Yeah. But they've traveled through the ways. We've had a couple of chapters of them okay. yeah, yeah. traveling and doing things. And there's no real mention of him wearing this scarf. And so it just sort of left my brain as a thing that yeah. happened. And so I guess his eyes are still messed up. I, P- possibly. Or maybe he's just used to it. Or now it's habit. Yeah. And now he like, doesn't feel comfortable without it. Or he thinks it looks cool. Yeah, I bet it doesn't but (laughs) because he always is like pushing it up over and like i just find it odd you know he might have some light sensitivity still yeah i think that's what it is because people looked at him oddly when he was wearing it so i don't think people were looking at him like oh that guy looks cool (laughs) that's a new fashion trend yeah Yeah. no people like what the hell's wrong with that guy (laughs) that's what it looks like you know to start a fashion trend you have to try a lot of things Mm -hmm. so okay yeah I don't think that's it. Okay, so only Perrin and Lan are still in their coats and acting like nothing is wrong. And I just think, like, I guess this is a wolf thing for Perrin. Yeah, I, w- I put down that, like, Perrin's kind of picking up some warder-like traits. But yeah. But it's not it, warder-like. No, it's, it's not. Yeah, but I it's guess how, animalistic, right? It's animalistic, and it's how Rand is seeing it. Rand is seeing it warder-like. And equivocating it to what Lan what is, Lan is yeah. doing because he's doing sort of the same things that Lan is doing being sort of solemn not really talking um they're doing sort of the same things but I really really doubt it's for the same reasons yeah I agree it's more like just not being affected by the elements as much yeah so and then my brain starts turning about how Elias <laughs> might have been a warder and Lan knew Elias and maybe this wolf thing is a warder thing yeah or vice versa or maybe warder's came from these wolf people okay, like now right, my yeah, brain yeah. is like maybe there is a connection because i wrote off i was like of course it's not the same it's just how ran seeing it somehow the wolf thing but like is sort maybe of like it is thing. all the same oh man but okay. that's like the obvious thing to think so i'd like to think that not the obvious thing okay i'm cool with that <laughs> the wolf magic is like water magic yeah it just sounds wrong i don't know but ran sees growth on leaves and on the trees and stuff and thinks oh it's good things are growing here but yeah. then he realizes that they're all covered in like gross disease and Lan says not to touch anything and then launches into a speech about how flowers can kill you in the blight 
and there are these crazy stick bugs that bite you and poison you so you have to cut off your arms or legs yeah it's like zombie curse where you gotta cut off the arm yeah Yeah. and you know that would have been nice to know before entering on this journey it's kind of the same thing as like it would have been nice to know in about Shatter the Shatter Logoth. Logoth thing. Exactly. That's exactly they it. They're yeah. not sharing enough information with these guys. Because Rand is literally like reaching out and is like, oh, this looks weird. And he's like, don't touch that. It can kill you. And he's like, oh, thanks. But, but that's the thing about common sense is it isn't that common. No, it's so not. So the things that make sense to Lana Moraine, like don't touch the gross, sick, diseased things in the blight... You know, Rand thinks, oh, it's a pretty flower. Let's let's touch it. Yeah. So. I just think, man, once again, leaving out important details that these stupid children need to be told explicitly. Yeah. That's really what this is. I agree. And I did tell you at the very beginning that one of my things about Maureen is I do think that one of her faults is she doesn't share her information. No. Yeah. And I think Lana's safety officer should have been on this one yeah. telling them what to expect in the blight. Should have been. Didn't. Didn't. But he is now, but it's like, there's a lot that they're like, what the hell is going on? Especially when we get into next chapter. Yeah. They were not even a little bit prepared. And maybe that was the point to like have them go in a little bit naive, but this just sounds dangerous. It sounds dangerous. From a safety perspective, if you tell everyone everything ahead of time, would it make them more reluctant to even go in in the first place? Well, they have to go. They don't have a choice. So We know that they don't have a choice, but even things like Shatter Logoth, would the people have put up more of a fight about entering the city had they known the real true risks? Might might have. They might have put up more of a fight. Yeah. I think Moraine has enough influence to say, too bad we're going in. This is our only chance. Yeah. But they would have been less likely to go off exploring on their own, <laughs> picking up more death cursed daggers. Right. Okay, so... So, it would have been better. The story would be less interesting, though. So, I (laughs) get it. I get it. Okay. So, it turns out that they are on the fringe of the Blight now, and the further they get, the more corrupted everything is, and some things are so gross that Rand wants to throw up, and Matt does throw up. And that's funny. Well, not funny, No, but Matt sure does have a weak stomach. Because he threw up in the ways yeah, also. Yeah, he did. the whole trollic thing. More than once. Yeah. And so I think that maybe, like, is he sick and he's, like, not completely healed? Or does he just have a weak just stomach a weak for stum- stuff, yeah. for things like this? It's very possible because, you know, some people are like that. Yeah. So... I don't know. It's so smelly and gross here that even Moraine's face is pale and her lips are tight and only Lan... And to Rand's surprise, Perrin yeah. aren't affected. Again, Again. Same thing. Same thing. So in case you forgot, Perrin's eyes are now yellow and they glow. Yeah. We get that again. Because wolves. Because wolves. Yeah. That's it. If That's you why. forgot. Yeah. So they can see the mountains of Dehoom in the <laughs> distance. I'm just joking. I know it's Doom. Yeah, that's okay. You can do that. You like Dehoom? Dehoom, yeah. You have to pronounce the H? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think Mountains of Doom without an H would be too close to Mount Doom from Lord of the Rings. What if it's D apostrophe H O O M? Then Ooh, that would for sure be Dehoom. That's right? even further, yeah. Well, maybe I don't know. Dehoom. Dehoom. <laughs> less less scary, I think. Yeah. Less threatening. Maybe. So there's the Mountains of <laughs> Doom, which are similar to what you said? Mount Doom from Lord of the Rings. There's Mount Doom and there's Misty Mountains. The Mountains of Mist. Yeah, those are intentional. Oh, yeah, because that's the same. Yeah. That's not different at all. No, that's totally intentional, too. Okay. That's like a big head nod to Tolkien. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We've, we've covered that before. Yeah, I know, but now <laughs> I'm, I'm getting refreshers. You right. know yeah. that I don't remember everything you've ever said, right? I didn't know that, and I am shocked and surprised now. <laughs> and appalled. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so anyways, they can see the Mountains of Doom in the distance, but Lan says they can't reach it by nightfall and it's dangerous to travel at night. And then Moraine says, I know a good place to camp in, and Lan seems less than thrilled, but agrees. Yeah. So, Moraine says, the eye of the world is beyond the high passes, or at least that's where it was the last time she found it. Yep. Yep. And it's better to cross the mountains in full daylight at noon when the Dark One's powers 
in the world are weakest. Yeah, and that's a very common fantasy trope where it's like when sun's at the highest peak, obviously the Dark Lord has less power. Right. Now, a couple things. Yep. Number one, I don't like when Maureen says noon. I wish that she said midday. Okay. That Why would don't you go, like noon? I think midday goes more with the tone of the language in this book. Okay. You know, like at midday, it sounds better to me. I'm going to have to do some research on where noon and midday came from. Yeah. yeah. I've been trying in my life to change noon to midday. How's Mid- that going? Not well. <laughs> <laughs> People aren't receptive to it. Okay. Turns out. Yeah. But if it's midnight, you know, yeah. it should be midday. I okay. like that better. I'll, the next fun fact, I'll do a thing about noon and midday and where the words came from. Okay. Cool. Write that down. Because yeah. you tend to forget things that you say you're going to do in our episode. I remember everything I always say always. <laughs> I yeah. am shocked and appalled. <laughs> okay. Other things aside from this noon business. I wonder why Moraine had to go look for the eye of the world before. That is a good question. Because it seems like a difficult task. Yeah. Do you have any speculation? Do you have any like ideas? Well, obviously there was some need because you only find the green man if there is a need for you to find the green man. Unless you're an ogier, in which case he's like, yeah, come on by. Yeah, he just wants to hang out with and sing songs with trees. Yeah. Also next <laughs> chapter. But... We have heard that the old gear elders yes. have like all visited the They've green man. They've all seen so. the green man. Yeah. And that's cool. But for humans, yes. there really seems to be some kind of need. Yeah. So in the past, something has happened where it was important to see the eye of the world. And what was that reason? Probably something to do with the dark one. Okay. I, I just know. I just want to know if you have any like crazy ideas or hmm. theories. I mean, this is your chance, right? Mm-hmm. Well, there's a reason Moraine is taking this eye of the world thing so seriously the minute she heard the eye of the world mentioned in camelin yeah they had to go there yeah if there was no playing around there was no let's stop in tarvalin there was no anything it was like this is dire we need to go yeah so like, whatever happened before has given her the experience to know that this is something serious it's the fact also that she clearly knows what the eye of the world is. Yes. Also that. So. So I just think. Okay. Something to do with the dark one. Yeah. I want to hear that story. Okay. That's all. And I maybe, bet I will. Maybe you will. I bet I will. Maybe you won't. No, I will. Okay. Yep. And then the other thing I want to note about just the powers in this world, sort of the dark one and his forces are less strong at midday. Yeah. I mean, it's a good kind of thing to note. Kind of like a vampire. Yeah. Stronger at night, can't be out during the day, that kind of stuff. Well, it's the light versus the shadow, right? Yeah, the shadow. And at high noon. There's no shadow at midday. Yeah. Mmm. Okay. I like that. That's good. Yeah. I got it now in my brain. Okay. (laughs) So, Egwene pipes up with her questioning. She wants to know if the eye of the world always sort of moves around. Yeah, because we know that you can't find it twice, and if you can't find it twice... That means it's not always in the same place. Yeah. And Loyal answers, the green man seems to be found where he is needed, but it has always been in the high passes, and they are haunted by creatures of the Dark One too. And I just think, oh good. So you really gotta, you know, make your way through this terrible, terribleness... Yeah. ...to find the green man. Yeah. Which apparently all the Ogiers had no problem doing. Well, they seem to be in tune with nature, right? Yeah. So maybe they have some sort of... System. Yeah. That Loyal doesn't know or have. That's true. But he he's... also is way too young. I was going to say, to he's be... too young to yeah. even be like knowing about this stuff. So yeah. maybe like the elders know a bunch of stuff. Yeah, probably way more. They've got like a secret handshake or something you got to do with a tree. Yeah. And then the green man's like, hey, yeah, here I am. <laughs> mm, I like that idea. It's a good one. <laughs> A bunch of description here about the blight. Yep. Turns up. And Oh, did you know the blight is bad? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I found that out. And gross. And gross. There are icky looking lakes and stuff everywhere. And so they come up to a place with a bunch of jagged topped hills. And then for a moment the sun catches the tops and Ran sees that they are actually broken remnants of seven towers boom Ooh. makes sense why land didn't want to come here 
And Maureen said it was a good omen. Yeah. To camp there. Just to rub it in Lan's face. Yeah, maybe. a little bit. Yeah. That's kind of what it seems like. Yeah. But Nynaeve is complaining. What else is new? She wants to camp down by the lakes where it might be cooler because they aren't used to this warmth at all. Like they are struggling. And cue the giant sea monster in the lake. <laughs> right. But first, Matt says he wants to stick his head in the lake. <laughs> Yeah. But then they see evil Loch Ness monster with like hands on the end of tentacles. And I can confirm that is the Loch Ness monster. Yes. yes. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Confirm. And he says, never mind. Yeah. I think right here will be just fine. Yeah. I yeah. think it is important to note though that like the description of this crazy weird monster of a creature has weird deformities and like hands protruding from it. It's not just a normal sea monster with Mm-mm. tentacles. No. It's a weird... And crazy, it's crazy deformation. Yeah, yeah, it's so gross. But that's the description of things we get later on too. Yes. Is that they're all sort of Frankenstein's gone wrong. Yeah. That's what it seems like. Yeah, absolutely. Frankenstein's monster. Frankenstein's, Frankenstein's the monster doctor. gone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Dr. Yeah. Frankenstein? And yeah, the Frankenstein monster. is the... Yeah, the guy. Okay. Because the monster is never technically named. Ah. <laughs> I have a joke. Carry on. Frankenstein enters a bodybuilding competition. Yeah. And finds out that he's read the rules incorrectly. Yeah, it's a good one. Bodybuilding. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, it's it's more of a Halloween y joke. Yeah, that's true. Well, to be fair, it's not like Frankenstein was a Halloween book. No, monsters are for Halloween, though. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so Moraine says that she will set wards, but not true barriers because of attracting things and alerting the Dark One to their presence. And we've gotten that multiple times before. Right. And Matt says something stupid about being happier with a physical barrier. Yeah. And then Egwene has a sassy retort and tells him he's a fool. And this makes Rand think of the good old days and he's happy for a minute before he sees Perrin's eyes again and realizes actually like where they are and what they're doing and how this is actually nothing like home. Yeah, I love the description of Matt though, where it's Matt saying what he should not at the worst possible time. Yeah. It's like, that's a good description of Matt. Yeah, no filter. But yeah. that's what makes him funny and likable. I, I agree. Yeah, or unlikable, depending on if you like people who just speak their minds. Yeah. Most people actually don't like that. <laughs> I think it's funny. Yeah. But that's just me. <laughs> So the boys and Lan unsaddle and hobble the horses. Um, and I just say again, for a sense of relative safety that they have for the night, like the fact that they're unsaddling the horses. Yeah. From what I know about horses, and it's not very much, it's not good to keep a saddle on a horse. Yeah, I know. This is just back to that time when they were all escaping and they kept the horses saddled. True. Because yeah. for a quick getaway. Yeah. Right? And so... Again, they're unsettling the horses, which means they're relatively safe for the night. They're yeah. not waiting for something to come and jump out at them that they need to get a quick getaway from. Yeah. So so then they turn back to where the women and loyal are, but they have disappeared. And the boys start to just freak out looking for danger and don't seem to think about how... Maureen just said that she was going to be setting wards. To be fair, all of her wards previously were not like, I can turn everyone invisible wards. They were, hey, don't worry, the dark creatures can't get us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I guess so, but I also... This is, this is for sure the first instance of Maureen turning everyone invisible. Yeah, for sure. It's very cool. Okay, that's fine. But I also think they should do a better job of listening and using their brains. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, that's the other side of it. But they're all freaking out. And Lan mutters, like, sheep herders, and thinks they're all stupid, and he walks back, and they follow him, and sure enough, they're all still there. Maureen smiles and says that it's just a bending, so any eye looking at them sees actually around them instead of seeing them. And Egwene says that she might be able to do it too. Yeah. You know what's funny is that with RJ's background in physics, the whole bending of light is a huge indication to his physics degree. Yeah. Because that's like what black holes do to light, and that's why light can bend around a black hole and stuff like that. Like, cool. It's kind of cool. Cool science. So Moraine says that Egwene cannot do this without training, though. And Perrin snorts, and Rand is uncomfortable that Egwene might have already been trying to use the power. Oh, my <laughs> God. 
Well, and they had that whole deal with Perrin and Egwene originally when she was trying to yeah, light that Yeah, but Rand bonfire. wasn't there. Rand hasn't seen any of that. Yeah, yeah. Rand doesn't know, so. But that's like Perrin snorting. Yeah, it yeah. is, actually. And so Nynaeve carefully says that she will be going with Egwene to Tar Valen when she goes. Hmm. And I went, oh, okay then. Yeah, like sure. it was your decision yeah. all along. Yeah, <laughs> like Egwene needs the company there. Like yeah. it's totally for Egwene and not for her. Not because she wants to totally learn no. how, to, how to do this. No, and Moraine just says, perhaps that would be for the best wisdom. Yeah. And Egwene is so happy and says that Rand will have to come too. And oh, maybe the others too. Always an afterthought. <laughs> but... Perrin shrugs and Matt gives a like non-committal grunt. Yeah, no one really says anything about, yeah, let's do that. Right. And then Rand thinks that her eyes have never been so big and bright before. More like pools that he could lose himself in. But a man could drown in those eyes and be happy doing it. <laughs> and I went, aw, he's like a smitten kitten. A little bit. Yeah. 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 It's cute. But Rand says, you know, there's going to be nothing for me to do there. There's no sheep. In Tarval, and, and all I know how to do is herd sheep. Yeah. Well, it's kind of funny, too, that you, you mentioned about Rand being smitten, but it's also kind of like he's having some dirty thoughts about Egwene. Yeah. Because that's why he's embarrassed and clears his throat, and yeah. he, like, changes the subject. So A little bit. You have to think this little conservative boy... Yeah. <laughs> he's like, oh, no, don't think that way. <laughs> yeah. I just thought, like... I thought it was more like he wants to just, like, be with her and marry her and love her. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shaking my head. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> but Moraine says that she can find something for them there if they want. Something he will find interesting. Yeah. And this is so cryptic. Like, I wonder what she actually means and how much does she actually know about Rand. So do you think that Moraine's plan is still to go to Tar Valen after this whole, you know, eye of the world business is done. Do you think that's still on her radar? I think it will depend on what they find out with this whole eye of the world stuff. Okay. Because she knows that the Dark One, for some reason, wants these three boys. And she knew that they were Taverin. Yeah. Right? She was looking for one. She found three. That was something she already knew. And her plan... I do think was to get them to Tar Valen. And so depending on what she finds out here at the Eye of the World, which I still have no Yeah, clue. you have not read that far. No, so. I have no idea what the Eye of the World actually is or what's there or if you talk to the Eye of the World and find <laughs> out information. It's like a Wizard like of Oz situation. Like the Wizard situation. of Oz, yeah, it's actually what I was thinking. There's <laughs> just a man behind Crank in a wheel. <laughs> it's going to give you some answers. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like that actually. It's a really good theory. It's probably the best one I've ever heard. <laughs> it's a good one. But yeah, so I don't know. I think that Yatar Valen is still there. Because we do know that she does have a blue friend. We do, yeah. She There are people there who Sherry she does M, connect to. Sherry M. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that the plan is still to go to Tar Valen after. Okay. Depending on... The results The of... result of what's going on here. Yeah. Because she might just have to like throw them into Mordor. And I mean like... We know that we're coming up on the end of a book, but they don't know that they the book is They don't know that, yeah. yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. So, I don't think in this book they're going to Tar Valen, if that's what your question is. No, just in general was in my general, question. In general, yeah. I think the plan is still to get them to okay. Tar Valen after whatever this is, is resolved. Yeah. It's just, it's a funny conversation they have here because Egwene's pretty adamant about like, I mean, after and she's- After this, we're going. Yeah. She's having the good thoughts about after all this is done, then we're going to go and learn everything's going to be happy and good again. Yeah. And it kind of but... reminds me of when Rand said to Loyal, uh, let's go, I'll see your house and you'll see mine yeah kind yeah. of thing when this is all over and loyal's all glummy and gloomy and yeah. goes well never be it'll never be over <laughs> do you think it's ever gonna be over yeah. yeah yeah okay but so Egwene decides that this means rand will be her warder yeah okay and he says he'd like that but then thinks about what min said about how they're not meant for each other yeah not in the way that you both think Right. Yeah. You know who else is going to be in Tar Valen who might throw a wrench in this plan? Who? Elaine. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Huh. Yeah, okay. I thought about that one. Okay, okay, okay. I thought about it. Yeah. Because uh, she'll be in Tar Valen. 
And if they're all going to go to Tarvalin. Ooh, and then what happens if Egwene and Elaine meet? Yeah, I'm sure they will. Okay. There's no way they don't meet. If they're all going to Tarvalin, of course they meet. Okay. Of uh, course all these characters meet at some point. <laughs> Are you joking? Okay. You don't know that all the characters will meet each other at some point. Uh, yeah, I do. Okay. Sure. Of sure. course they yeah. do. And they're all the same age and stuff. Like, it's all, of course it's going to happen. Do you think there's going to be like a jealous rivalry? There may be. Okay. There might be. I don't think that Elaine and Nynaeve will get along if Nynaeve's going too. Sure. Because Nynaeve is like the worst. And then we have and Gawain Elaine... and Rand who are like best friends. Yeah. It'll be an interesting <laughs> dynamic. I hope for that in the future. Sure. I don't know. Yeah, it'll You're be smiling. fun. You're smiling. Like, it's great. It's good to, it's good to it's think good about these speculation. things. It's good speculation. Yeah, because yeah, I thought about that. I was like, who else is in... Tarvalin. Oh, right. Yeah. Because I was actually thinking recently about how we haven't heard anything about what's happening with Loghain and Elaine and um, Gawain. Yeah. Because they were going north, right? And probably around right now, timeline wise, because it was going to be like four days or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's only been a couple of, like, it hasn't really yeah. been that long. And so but... they're going to Tarvalin. And I sort of speculated okay. that they were going to Tarvalin with too them, yeah. with them or and something. And that kind of made sense too at the time. So. Right. Although I did always have a little bit of a feeling that they weren't going to get to Tarvalin. Yeah. Just because of the name of that book. Yeah. To the Blight. Yeah. But I thought maybe they'd go to Tarvalin and then go to the Blight through Tarvalin. Yeah. I didn't actually, who, who knows? I didn't actually know. So. But. Back to this, because Rand is going to have trouble sleeping tonight after this conversation. <laughs> and he actually sees that Lan is still awake and staring out to the night. And then notices that Nynaeve is still awake too, watching Lan. Ooh. Whoa. Okay. So she pours a cup of tea and brings it to Lan, thinking that everyone is asleep. And she says, I didn't know you were a king. And he says, I'm not a king, just a man. A man with basically nothing to his name. And then Nynaeve replies that some women only need the man. And by some women, she means her. Her, yeah. (laughs) And he says that she is a remarkable woman, as beautiful as the sunrise and as fierce as a warrior. And he calls her a lioness. These are some pretty blatant compliments here. Yeah. Yeah. And then he says that he is not worthy of her. And I just think, what is going on here? Like, what is going on? They clearly have been having a lot of late night chats. Yeah, this is this doesn't seem like the first one. This isn't some unspoken, making eyes at each other thing. They've been together since... After the river. Yeah. Right? They've been traveling together with Moraine. This entire time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a lot has gone on that we have not seen clearly because this is is intense. It is. This is like a breakup scene. Yes. It's not a good, it's not a good way the conversation is going. No. Because Lan clearly like has some mutual affection for Nynaeve. Oh, yes. This isn't just a one way. Very, very. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you could also like speculate that, oh, maybe Lan isn't even interested in her and trying to let her off the hook. But no, I don't think that I never thought that. But yes, you could speculate. Yeah. It's just because there's a lot of stuff that we don't see. No, I thought from the minute he met her, he was impressed with her as a woman and therefore attracted to her. And and that kind of brings back to like when he compliments her, you know, tracking skills. Yes. Like those little tidbits of information that when we first read them, they don't seem like very much. Well, and then that whole thing where he like wants to go back to find her and Maureen gets mad at him. Because he almost doesn't listen to her. Yeah, it's clearly mutual, but... This makes it very solidified that this is actually something that's going on. And Lan is saying it's not going to happen. Right. And here's the thing, though. Like, this is how serious it is because Nynaeve says that wisdom seldom marry. Like, yeah. they're talking about getting married. And I mean, I guess that's not that big a deal in Emmonsfield because if we're going to be with someone, it's marriage. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. But, this seems more like a before you do anything. But it's like... You get married. Yeah. So... But that's still pretty serious. It is, yeah. Because they're thinking, or she's thinking of being with him. Like, this is more than just like an infatuation. Yeah. So she is going to Tarvalin 
And she is to be something other than a wisdom. Yeah, because, I mean, he's like a king, so maybe being a wisdom isn't good enough. But... Right. Well, no, she says wisdom seldom marry. And then he says, well, Aes Sedai's also don't really get married because few men can handle that much power in a wife. Yeah, but Lan could. <laughs> and she says that she knows such a man. Yeah. Ah, like it's so good. It's so cute. But he's like, no way. He says that all he has is a sword and he can never stop fighting. And she says, I've told you I care nothing for that. So this just another little solidifier that they have talked in the past. And they have talked about this. Yes. Specifically this conversation they've had in the past. And Lan has been being very, very stubborn. Yes, turns out. But Lan kind of shuts her down by saying... That he will hate the man she chooses because it won't be him, but love him because he makes her smile. And I just think that's the cutest thing and the worst thing all at the same time. It's cute, but he's being an idiot. Yeah. Basically, he is someone who is certain to die in battle, and that's not fair for her. Yeah. And I just think maybe you should let her decide what's fair for her and what she wants. Well, that's that's one part of it. But also it's Lan's philosophy of the whole speech that Egelmar gave. Yeah. About you have to avenge what cannot be defended. So Lan's philosophy is that he needs to avenge Malkier. And the only thing he wants to do in life is get that revenge. Right. So he's being a stubborn... Butthole. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the best way to describe him right now. Yeah. Well, and clearly he has feelings for her and she has feelings for him. And I don't know if it's his sort of self-esteem. Like he just thinks that what he can offer her isn't good enough. Because just himself and his love or whatever isn't enough. Especially in this world where you marry for land. You marry because your parents set it up. You marry because whatever, whatever. You marry for royalty or you marry for power. So do you think that it's just this? Or do you think there's some outside influence from Moraine, like, telling him you can't marry her? Do you think that's part of it? Oh, yeah. Mama says no. And Lan's using the whole, you know, I don't have any land or (laughs) whatever you want to call it. I think that's part of it. I think he's serious about that. Like, you deserve more. Do you think Maureen has can give influence you in this decision? A hundred percent. Oh, okay. yes. You think she does? Oh, yeah. And okay. we got that when Lan tried to leave and was a little bit defiant. Yeah. And Maureen was pissed about it. <laughs> like put him back in place. Yeah. Yeah. And we do get a little bit next chapter, too, about the dynamic with Maureen involved. Yeah, yeah. So I think we should get into that because okay. this chapter ends with... Lan just shutting her down, saying it's not fair for you. And he just gets up to check on the horses. And Nynaeve sits there crying. This is the worst. The end. And Ren closes his eyes and is like, maybe I shouldn't be watching this anymore. Yeah. <laughs> now that it's over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now I'll go to sleep. Yeah. But well, I mean, that's how I over I, like spy on people too. <laughs> oh, yeah? How many people you spy on? All the time. All the time. Yeah. By pretending to sleep. Those midnight conversations. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, chapter 49... I really want to get right into it. Sure. The Dark One stirs. So the picture is the same as the previous chapter, The Blight. Yeah. And now that I've read the chapter, it's clearly the spooky, tainty, evil, alive trees. Yeah. So it totally makes sense. The last two pictures have been this Blight tree because they're in The Blight. Right. So Rand wakes up, notes that the sky is still blue and that's somewhat of a comfort in this place. He thinks about the conversation he overheard last night and sees Nynaeve's red-rimmed eyes and notes she clearly didn't get any sleep. Yep. And Egwene goes over to have a chat with Nynaeve, like a little girl talk. So, and that kind of just draws to the fact that Egwene and Nynaeve have had conversations about Lan. Yes. And Nynaeve and Lan have had conversations. Yeah, because Egwene clearly knows what's going on and she's all mad at Lan out of like solidarity. Well, Egwene probably, they they probably had a conversation with Nynaeve talking to Lan last night. Yeah. And Egwene's coming over to find out how it went. Maybe. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. Okay. Which would make sense why there's like a bit of a back and forth. And he like tries to laugh it off. Maybe saying, you know, it didn't yeah. go well, but whatever. I don't need no, you know, no land in my life. So. Yeah. 
And then Rand thinks that Lan doesn't seem to notice. <laughs> but you know what, Rand? Yeah. Lan notices all. Well, he notices that he's not noticing the same way he's not noticing the seven broken towers exactly. of his old home. Yes. So Lan's just like in the... I kind of feel bad for Lan a little bit. Yeah. He's... You know, he's very... not accepting the love. I don't think yeah. he thinks he's worthy of love. I think that's really what it comes down to. Could he doesn't that. think he's good enough for it. He thinks that he has other things to worry about in his life, and he's not good enough for her. He's not worthy of it, and she'd be better off without him. Yeah. I can see him as the kind of guy who'd be like, they're just feelings. I can bottle them up and oh, push yeah. them down. Oh, yeah. I'm and... a tough warder. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a tough freaking uncrowned king. Hey, just bury your feelings until you die. Right. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Easy. Yeah. So they're all getting ready to go and Moraine does a thing. She yes. stands still with her eyes closed, basically like not even breathing. And Nynaeve and Egwene are the only ones who seem to react. So what do you think's happening here? Some kind of power. Okay. Manipulating. And why are Egwene and Nynaeve reacting? Because they can feel the power. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, no, that's, that's all I got for you. That's it's, just what I want to see. It's relatively straightforward. She's clearing out the wards. Yeah, she's clearly doing something with channeling. She's like making the wards. She's making the wards disappear. Disperse. disperse yeah. Go away. Yeah. Get out of here. Shoo. Shoo wards. Shoo wards. Get out of here. Right. Because we do learn that the wards are going to disperse over the course of like a day. Right. She's just like encouraging it to happen faster. Yes, but. Nynaeve and Egwene sort of like shiver despite the heat of the blight. They stop and look at each other. Egwene grins and Nynaeve sort of half-heartedly smiles back. Yeah, so maybe they can like start to sense something. Yeah, and Rand thinks he's missed something here, but no time for that now. No time to think about this anymore. The computer's starting up. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but I mean, it makes sense. The three women who can channel, Maureen's doing some channeling. So Egwene and Nynaeve who are like new to channeling probably picking something up now. Yeah, and Nynaeve's like upset that she can feel it. Yeah. <laughs> and Egwene's happy she can feel it. Yeah, and that kind of falls in line with their... Yeah. Yeah. I got something for you here though. Oh, sure. Okay. Matt demands... Ah, you noticed that. Okay. What are we waiting for? Yes. And I write, uh-oh, the return of Cursed Matt. Possibly. Returning. Slow okay. returning. Well, we know that healing was only going to last a little while. Yes, and it will happen again if he doesn't get fixed in Tarvalin. That's true. This sounds like sort of how it happened in the beginning. He and just... they were originally supposed to go directly to Tar Valen, and now they're not. And you alerted me to this whole Matt demanding things. I did, a long time ago. So Matt demanded again, and he hasn't in a while, and now he's demanding. Good. So. I mean, not good, bad. Yeah, good I noticed it. Yeah, good you noticed yeah. it. So they get on their way, and Egwene wants to know if they will reach the Eye of the World today, Maureen said I. And notice that Egwene is using the title. Yes. The sort of sensei teacher title. <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah. So Moraine says that she hopes so and gives Loyal a sidelong look. Hmm. Like she's like, I know the Green Man will find you. Yeah. That's basically what she's counting on. I mean, she's got a lot of, you know, tools on her side. Yeah. But the Green Man senses need and there can be no greater need than ours. Our need is the hope of of the world not to be dramatic right but as they get closer to the mountains they enter the true blight yeah so the slow progression is getting heavier yeah so everything is like sickly and rotten and evil and i just have like a call back to this is why you can't burn wood here yeah clearly yeah the trees are <laughs> live entities yeah they'll try to eat you yeah yeah clearly evil don't burn those trees Probably breathing in the fumes is bad. Yeah. And it would probably like attract a lot of attention and... Oh yeah. That too. Yeah. So Moraine warns about the trees wanting to grab them, but says that her presence protects them. And they sort of laugh uneasily. And Ram thinks that trees don't move. Why would a tree want to grab a man? And Moraine is just trying to keep them alert. Yeah. I bet not. And then... The tree totally eats something. Yeah, he sees a tree (laughs) whip around and attack something. And I go, okay, so that's where we're at now. Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right. So Lan all of a sudden grabs his sword and says, keep moving and stay with Moraine. And then he takes off from the direction they came. And Nynaeve is concerned and says, Lan, he 
But Moraine gives her a sharp, he can look after himself, ride, wisdom. Yeah, so we often understand that Lan and Moraine have had many adventures into the Blight. Like, clearly, they know what's up. Yeah. And Nynaeve still has that whole, even though they had a fight last night. Yeah. She still feels for him. Yes. So. But Moraine is like, he can look after himself. You have to wonder you how much. You need to go. Like, yeah. You have to wonder how much Maureen has like put up with her and these talks with Lan. Yeah. Because you have to assume that Maureen knows what's going on. Yes. Because of the whole Lan Maureen connection. Yeah. So. I agree. Especially because I still believe that Maureen has somewhat of a mind reading ability. Yeah, of, of Lan. Yeah. yeah. I didn't write it down, but there's a point where Lan is incredulous of women reading his mind. And thinks that all women are Aes Sedai. I don't remember if that's last chapter or if that's this chapter. That was Rand. Yeah. And that was last chapter. Did I say chapter. Lan? Yeah. Oh yeah, Rand. Yeah. Rand has this thing where he thinks all women can read his mind and then he goes, are all women Aes Sedai? I think that just means that all women are like confusing. Yes. And complicated. Yeah. But I also think it's a little bit of a a little poke. Okay. okay. A little Aes Sedai can read minds. Just like a hint? Yes. All right. Yeah. And I think Lan... It's like an RJ hint. And I think Rand might know about it. How would Rand know about it? I don't know. Stories. Aes Sedai can read your mind. Probably. I mean, there's a lot of equivocation between Aes Sedai and witches. Yep. Right? So, and witches are, you know, one of their abilities sometimes is mind reading. Maybe. So, okay. Could be. Part of the story. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. If it comes up, we'll go back to it. But I did make a note of it, and I just don't know where it is. Okay. Well, if we come across it. Oh, no. There it is. Yeah, it's the very beginning of this chapter. Oh, we already passed it. Yeah, yeah. we passed it. It's the very first page okay. of the chapter. Yeah, I was like skipping <laughs> all of the getting ready to leave business because yeah, it was a lot. Yeah. So A lot of description. Yeah. Oh, also the blight is bad. Oh, okay. If you haven't noticed. Shoot. Are Perrin's eyes still yellow? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So Lan reappears and his sword is dripping with black blood and like steam is rising from it and he wipes it clean with a cloth that falls apart and dissolves as he drops it yeah so the blood is corrosive here. gross yeah not good yeah the blood of what the tree or something so like, he he didn't go towards the tree he went away so he went off into the forest to kill something okay so we don't know if that he it was could a, sense or hear or something yeah, yeah okay. i mean lan does have that like detect detect evil presence right. sense so so some other evil creature jumps out at them and before lan can even turn around to face it matt shoots it in the face with an arrow yeah go matt and lan even compliments him yeah. Good shooting, sheep herder. And then is like immediately back to it. So, yes. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. Good reaction time for Matt. That's improving. So we, we did learn that Matt has very quick hands. Yes. Tom did mention that. But his reaction time wasn't the best. Like he was caught around the neck with the noose <laughs> and stuff. He's had some bad luck. So. Rand even snuck up on him and scared him almost off his horse. Like <laughs> he's not the, he wasn't the most prepared. And I think now maybe being cursed put him in this like heightened sense of, whoa, where's that? Who's, who is this? <laughs> Who's Always looking at me? Who's trying to get, Being yeah. suspicious of everyone. <laughs> Who's so, trying to get my dagger? <laughs> yeah, he's got this heightened sense of, I'm going to get you. Yeah. So. I like that. I'm okay with that. Yeah. So I think it's good. But, but one really big important thing to note Previously, when Matt was going to be attacking people, he would be reaching for his dagger and forgetting about his bow. That's right. Here, he uses his bow. Well, same within the ways. Yeah. He just like shot the arrow into nothing. And I yeah. really sort of hope now that I was <laughs> thinking about it, I wish that he got Fane. Yeah. But. How easy. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just. No, man. In the distance. <laughs> that really hurt. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Someone's over there. <laughs> Oh, that's you funny. shot me. <laughs> yeah, okay. But Moraine notes that the thing should not have been willing to come this close to one who touches the true source. Maybe the dark one is stirring. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe that's it. I just put a note important. Yeah. So the blight's taking risks. Yes, it is. And we get that later too with the green man. Yeah. Because he says. It's weird. They're trying to get in here. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) 
But, yeah, but anyways, they all take off and Rand takes out his sword because the trees are all like flailing for them now. And the scene just like gets super intense. It is war fight scene. Yeah, so everyone's like hacking and slashing and they fighting They really their way. don't seem to care about the true source. These trees are going for them anyway. As they ride, Rand is like taking down branches that are reaching for them. And he reaches for the void and finds it in the stony soil of the two rivers. There you go. There we go, bud. You got it. He's getting it. Yeah, but he also bares his teeth in a rictus snarl. And I guess that this saying is not only reserved for Matt and Mordeth any longer. Not anymore. Yeah. Hopefully. Unless Rand is now cursed. From oh, being in no. the presence well, he's of been in, the dagger. He's been in the presence the longest of everybody. Yeah. Well, and Matt. I mean, besides Other Matt. That. Other than that. Yeah. <laughs> so. But that rictus snarl line. Ah. Uh, You're really looking for it. Ah, uh, it just gut speaks to me. Okay. It's more death. <laughs> That's who's following them in the ways. There you go. <laughs> It wasn't actually Fane. Yeah. Surprise twist. It's actually Mordeth. Oh, no. <laughs> Coming for his dagger. It's going to happen. It's got to, right? <laughs> 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 no? Nothing? Not even words? That not, means it, I, I'm not going to say anything. That means I'm on the right track. Yeah. Sometimes saying nothing is as bad as saying something. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Yep. I decline to answer. Yeah, that means I'm right. Yeah. Like, if you won't say anything, I think that means that I'm totally right about this. What's the legal thing I don't recall? The legal th- You just, like, it's an out for everything? Oh, I don't recall. Because your memory is so it's bad. what a lot of politicians do. Oh, I don't, I don't recall. Hmm. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Such a non-answer. It is a bad non-answer. Yeah. We know you recall. But sometimes <laughs> your non-answer gives me all the answers I need. Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. About 50-50. <laughs> anyway, though, Rand yells out, Menetherin as a war cry. Yeah, I mean, it's not bad. No, and it's what he did last time. Yes, way back when, at the beginning of the book. And then Matt does the thing where he speaks in the old tongue language while fighting. But this is an important thing to note, too, is he does say some of the things he'd previously said, and he says some new things. Oh, I, I didn't even read it. I thought it was just all the same. Yeah, no, it's not all the same. Even if I read it, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't. <laughs> I didn't look back and compare. I just figured it was the same because what Rand says is the same. Yeah, so he says for the honor of the Red Eagle, for the honor of the Rose of the Sun, and then we don't get a translation for the remainder of it. Ooh, okay. And I just think it's important to note that Matt is adding in some of this old tongue into his speech. Right. Yeah. Obviously that he doesn't know being Matt. And it's like his old blood singing or whatever. Yeah. The old blood being strong. In the you boys. know that. So. Right. So at this point, Perrin is using his axe against everything. And the flailing trees are actually shying away from Perrin. And shying away from his fierce golden eyes as much as they are shying away from the axe. Yeah. So another interesting point just about... Perrin's eyes are different. It's almost as if there's good hunting along the blight. Ah, and it's almost like the things in the blight don't want to be near whatever Perrin is. Yeah, they like recognize it. Yes. Okay, Moraine is also shooting like fireballs at everything, which she doesn't really like to do. And Lan is in and out of the trees fighting and reporting back. Yeah, it's kind of cool that Lan is like heading off fighting a bunch of stuff, getting injured. Yeah. Probably being a little bit, you know, reckless to kill more stuff. Yeah. And then coming back for Moraine to heal him and then going back out. Yeah. So. Well, and with Moraine shooting fireballs and healing him and stuff, she says that she is lighting a signal fire for the Dark One to know. And that's really important because we've heard that before. Yes. Balzamon said that to Rand. Sometimes you light signal fires. Yes. And other times you Right. Which is interesting because... Basically, right after she says that, everything sort of goes still and silent, and the trees sort of go still, and Lan says that there are worms. Yes. And he says it very grimly, 
And they all take off riding from whatever worms are. Yes, not good. No, and it turns out that they are super terrible and can kill a fade. And these guys have an entire pack of worms on their trail. Yes, worms are the capital W because Matt clearly doesn't even pick up on that. Yeah. And it's like, what are they afraid of worms for? Yeah. It's like, not that kind, not Matt. Not earthworms, <laughs> Matt. Like, you know where you are, yeah. right? like pay attention. But it is important to note that it's kind of like there's always a bigger fish yeah. where there's something in the blight that'll eat the monsters that even the monsters are afraid of. Right, but they so. ride hard for the mountains because the worms apparently are afraid of whatever is in the mountains. Yeah, so it's like maybe we can avoid the bigger monster. So there's worse stuff waiting for them there. Yeah. So they can hear the worm pack getting closer and Lan announces that they aren't going to make it and he goes to turn back to fight them and Nynaeve yells... No. Yeah, Lan's basically thinking he's going to go Yeah. sacrifice, sacrifice himself. himself to save the group. But Moraine says, be quiet, girl, but then tells Lan that even he cannot stop a worm pack, and she says that she will not have it. She will need him for the eye of the world. Yeah, it's like, don't go kill yourself over this. Yeah. Think, think it through a little bit. But they're basically fucked. Yeah, like, from what it sounds like, yeah. There's a worm pack on them. They're not going to outrun them. If Lan can't go back and sacrifice himself, like, what's going to happen? The arrows won't work. They don't really feel pain. They have to just be cut up into pieces. Yeah. And then Rand starts to feel a tightness yeah. in his shoulders, and his whole chest feels tight, like he can hardly breathe, and he really starts freaking out about how there's worse things ahead of them, and there's shitty things behind them, and life isn't worth anything and what's happening right yeah, now he's kind of having like a little mini panic attack yeah and his bones start to feel like they're gonna shatter and he decides he's gonna turn around and go back and basically sacrifice himself yeah because what's behind him apparently is better than what's ahead of him and he doesn't want to like you know have a Gwen die because of him so right and i think oh boy here we go so this is an important Another yes. Rand channeling event. Yeah, it seems that way. Because it's been a while since we've had one, and I've been looking out for this. So this is the important thing, too, to note, because we've gotten that progression of closer and closer channeling events, yeah. where there's supposed to be some moment where if he doesn't figure things out, he's going to like start that counter that kills him. Right. And we don't really know where he's at in that cycle, no, if that's how it works. No, and I don't even... At this point, reading the book, yep. it is still very, very unclear. Yep. Like, it is still hidden in the writing that these are even happening. Yes. It is not even explicitly stated. It is still speculation on my end that True. Rand can channel. Yes. It hasn't even been talked about the only thing we're doing is like putting together events from what we've yes, heard yes i'm talk logicking about. out the puzzle yeah absolutely. that's what i'm doing i'm using logic to just sort of figure this stuff out from what's in the writing yeah so at this point this whole counter and countdown from when the channeling event and the reaction to the channeling event happen are getting closer together but the only thing we know specifically that actually happens is from what happens for women. Yes. Is it different for men? Is it the same? What's going on? And this is clearly, to me, something happening. It's very similar to the other things that have happened with Rand, where he gets a feeling, a physical feeling in his body before something happens. And it's almost like a life or death situation he's put exactly. in. Exactly. So the last one that happened was in the cellar in Four Kings with Goad. Yes. And the lightning strike. Yeah. Right, so that's the last time we got Rand having these feelings and then something remarkable happening. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. So what's interesting here is he's feeling this way, he's about to go back and face the worm pack, and then all of a sudden, the blight basically disappears around them and everything is green and nothing is scary or terrible. Everything is actually quite lovely with butterflies and flowers and buzzing bees and singing birds. And everyone is stopped and looking around in astonishment. Moraine says that they have reached 
safety. Hey. And listen about what I thought originally when I read this. Did you think steading? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not what I thought. I thought, oh man, I was looking forward to what was going to happen with Rand's channeling episode. Oh. I wanted to go see him channel. <laughs> and it's just coincidence they ran into the green man. But the second time I read through the chapter, yeah. writing my notes, I wrote, idiot, this was the channeling episode. <laughs> it all clicked. But okay, it was the okay. second time I read through it that I went, oh. There you go. So something it's triggered. It's incredible yeah. that the green man has been found before the high passes. Yes. This is something unheard of. And by someone who has been there twice. And by someone who has been there twice. Which is supposed to be impossible. Impossible. Even we, the green man says. Even the says, green man says it's, and we'll get there, we'll get there. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. So, so. this was the channeling yeah. episode. And I thought, oh man, I really wanted to go see him kick some worm butt. <laughs> like that's really yeah, yeah. what I thought. And I was like, oh, I guess this is just coincidence. Chop up some worms with the power or yeah. something. So no. Okay. Yeah. Danielle. When you said the first thing you thought was like a place, it was because that was what Perrin thought when he entered the setting. It was like, oh, safety. Yeah. Right? So, or Elias said that we've reached safety. Yeah. That's why I thought that's what you were going to say. Oh, it is similar to that too. Yeah. And I think maybe the first time I read through, I thought of it as that scenario that okay. they're riding hard for their lives and then all of a sudden they've reached safety and it's just kind of coincidence. Mm-hmm that Rand was about to have this channeling episode and then he doesn't, but no, he does. Okay. I think it's pretty clear now, especially from my, this read and us talking about it, that this was the life or death situation. They needed this now more than anything. And it's pretty remarkable that this has happened. Yes. So that's what this seems to be anyway. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Okay. So this is the green man's place. And the eye of the world is here. Yes, and we know that they are, in a sense, one and the same. Right. But different. Different. So nothing of the blight can enter here, which is also interesting because if the eye of the world is here, yeah. how would the dark one enter the green man's place to blind the eye of the world? Good question. Right. Thank you. Because... It sounds like the dark one is pushing in and even things like the trees, which should have left Moraine alone. Yeah. The blight is weren't. trying harder. Yeah. yeah. Really hard. Okay. Yeah. Well, they have a plan, right? Clearly. So. so Rand is confused and says that he thought that this place was always beyond the high passes. Hmm. And a deep voice answers him from the trees and I go, oh, it's the green man, I bet. <laughs> I and, mean, that's that's a pretty good, you know, guess. So. Right? Okay. So this voice says, This place is always where it is. All that changes is where those who need it are. How philosophical. Yes, very philosophical. Yeah. Yeah. Like, okay. I mean, a lot of the things that we hear from the green man in this in this chapter, you know, touch on that whole philosophy of what, what the world is kind of coming to. Right. Something that just, like, doesn't quite make sense. But it sounds smart, so you go, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you kind of nod and agree. Yeah. Yeah. That's what philosophy is, right? Yeah. Just think sounding smart and being really confusing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so he steps out of the trees, and it is literally just a giant green Huge. man. So this is the thing. The green man is as much bigger than loyal as loyal is bigger than Rand. Right. And we know that Rand, Rand is, is like... Tall. Rand's like six and a half feet tall. Yeah. And Loyal is half again as tall as Rand, which would probably put him to like, I don't know, 10 to 12 feet ish, yeah. like 10 yeah. feet. And then this green man is like, again, so he's like 15 to 20 feet tall. Yeah. Like, that's cool. crazy and big. And he's big. And he's made of grass and vines, and his eyes are huge hazelnuts, and his fingers are acorns. And he even has clothes made out of leaves. And I just think, why does he need clothes if he's made out of, like, vines? Modesty. Big vine penis. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> well, here's a thought. The statue of David is about 15 and 20 feet tall. Yeah. That's a person, and he also doesn't wear clothes. That's true. But 
This isn't <laughs> like a human person who like needs to be covered up for any reason. You well, you know what? He's Maybe... made of grass and vines. Yeah. Like, what does he need a tunic made of leaves for? You know what? Just because, okay? Modesty. Yeah. You don't want to scare anyone with your big naked green butt. (laughs) (laughs) You think he's got a butt? I haven't (laughs) actually. You know what? To be fair, in my years of reading this, I haven't thought too much on it. You know, my goal in reading these books is to getting you to look at new (laughs) perspectives. And for one... Why does the green man wear a tunic made of leaves? And more importantly, does the green man have a butt? And a penis. <laughs> That's what I want to know. All right. <laughs> We're kind of assuming he's a man. Well, he's the green man. That's what people call Is him. Is there a green woman? Maybe. Do you think that he has a name? No. That's not the green man. No, like, I don't. Because in the next sort of bit, Egwene says, oh, the green man. And he says, of course course i am who else would be here <laughs> okay. like, i think that's his name it's his title and his name all in one okay but so, also yeah. there's an interesting part about his description yes that i want to touch we, on yeah, because he seems to. to have this huge scar on his face yes and i'm interested in that story a deep fissure ran up his cheek and temple across the top of his head yeah and it's not like a scar like a typical human would have but it is a scar where he's all green, and this is sort of like wilty brown. Yes. Where, like, things won't grow again. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of cool. And I'm interested in that story. Okay. About... Do you have any speculation right now? Well, the thing is, he's wary of people. Sure. And people are aggressive. He likes Ogier because they're pretty well-behaved. <laughs> that's a good They're word. Ogier... From what I understand, are pretty calm, thoughtful, aren't prone to violence. Are totally in touch with nature, which the green man is. (laughs) I would say that probably something happened with humans, which makes the green man tentative to want to see humans. So here's some speculation too. We know that the green man is the protector of... The eye of the world. The eye of the world. Yeah. So... Yeah, so, yeah, some stuff probably happened. Okay. Some good stuff that I'm interested to hear about. All right. So yeah, Egwene says the obvious. And this is where the green man looks to Loyal and says, It's good to see you, little brother. And that title, Little Brother, so is... So cute. Yeah. It's so cute. I love it. But I it also it. kind of infer, like it suggests the family. relationship. Yeah. It, it infers family. Yeah. And in the past, many of you came to visit... But few of recent days. And Loyal says, you honor me, tree brother. Tree brother. So nice. Yeah. Which and again is kind of like suggesting that. So cute. That, yeah. And he puts his giant arm around Loyal, making him look like a boy because that's how tall he is. He's gigantic. <laughs> and he says, there is no honoring here. We will sing together and keep the longing at bay. And then he sort of starts to look at the others and study them. And this is like super important information. He says a bunch of important things all at once. Really quickly. And then it's like end of the chapter. That's yes, it. Yep. I know. Which is why I'm eager <laughs> to read. You went away for work last week. And so we haven't recorded yep. in a while. I haven't read a new chapter in over a week, which has been killing me, by the way. Yeah. I just thought I'd put that out there. It's going to get worse before it gets better. I know, because there are literally four chapters Yeah. after this one. We're going to have to just do it all. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're going to be so busy. Use your sick days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it's a very busy time at work. <laughs> yeah. All right, back to Perrin. All important things. Perrin. So he is called Wolf Brother. Yes, the green man recognizes him. As like, immediately. As, see, immediately. Sees him. Yeah. Ah, a wolf brother. Do the old times truly walk again? And again, recognizing that the wolf brother is something that's older. Older than old. Older than old. Like before Age of It, Legends Old. Mm -hmm. We've heard that before. Then he looks to Rand. Yes. And hold on. Oh my God. So this paragraph, we need to unpack one sentence at a time. It is so good. Oh yeah. So he says, strange clothes you wear, child of the dragon. And then he says... Has the wheel turned so far? 
do the people of the dragon return to the first covenant? But you wear a sword. That is neither now nor then. And Ran says, what the fuck, man? Yeah, like surprise, surprise, Ran doesn't understand. Yeah. But let's discuss these sentences. It's a big, big one. Yeah. So strange clothes you wear, child of the dragon. Yeah. We have heard, and again, tying that to the do the people of the dragon, we've heard this phrase, people of the dragon before. Yeah, they're the followers of the dragon. They're the followers of the dragon. And in these day and ages, yep. this day and age, the people of the dragon are followers of people who call themselves dragon. Yes. So in this day and age, it's a very negative thing to be yeah. people of the dragon because basically you're following the dark one because everyone thinks that the dragon is the dark one and no, they're different. No, they're the same. And keep in and mind evil. the keep in mind the prophecy that says that, and this is why Loghain called his army the people of the dragon because... To the, bring them to tear. Tear, because the people of the dragon will stone take Stone that's not a stone, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> right? Sort of, yeah. Sword that's not a sword in the stone. <laughs> yeah, the sword, the in, the sword stone, in the stone. That's not a sword. Shoots. <laughs> yeah. All of that. The second part about has the wheel turned so far. So again, that just comes down to the ages of this green man has been around for... Ages and ages and ages. A long time. Ages. To the fact that he knows the old times and the wolf brothers. And, and he, he gets it all. Yeah. And then the next one... So when it says, do the people of the dragon return to the first covenant? Well, it just kind of, I think that he's referring to the clothes that Rand is wearing. So Rand is wearing sort of commoner, peasant, farmer clothes. So here's a question. Do you remember the second covenant? So we've heard of a (laughs) second covenant. Okay. We haven't heard of the first covenant okay. yet. Okay. What? When did we hear? Remind me. It was back in the history lessons about what happened in the world. Okay. So after the breaking of the world, there was the second covenant that was formed, which was a allegiance between nations, including Manetherin, to like the 10 nations of the world. Oh, yeah, gathered yeah, together yeah. And Tyr was one of them, right? Yeah, there was like Tyr, Manetherin, and a couple others, mm-hmm. like eight others, basically. I think it says there's 10, yeah. 10 nations. But they all joined together to fight off the Dark One after the world had broken. So that was the second covenant. And now he says, are you are the people of the dragon returning to the first covenant? Like, because the wheel is turning and we've gotten to like the first age or something again? Like, I don't know. I don't understand what any of this means. So if we know that the second covenant happened about 3,000 years ago, after the world broke, the first covenant would have happened probably during the Age of Legends. Yeah. So the people of the dragon have been around since. Yes. The breaking, like before then. Yeah. I'm just thinking of the whole cyclical nature of time. Yeah. Where ages come and go and come to pass or whatever the saying is. Okay, and okay. It's like the so first it's age around. comes around yeah, again. Yeah. That's what I thought of okay. when I read Return to the First Covenant. I guess in my brain I thought Return to the First Age. Gotcha. Kind of thing. So in my first reader brain, yep. which I think sometimes you fail to understand. Yeah, I know. So, I have no, like no idea and that's what okay. this means. And that's the point. I'm not supposed to get this. I think as a first reader, what I'm supposed to get out of this little paragraph is the name Rand and the name <laughs> Dragon. Yeah. And I mean, the point of this podcast is for me to help you connect dots quicker. Absolutely. Than you sure. normally would. I, so. I get that too, but it's also kind of confusing. Yeah. And it's interesting to note that as a first time reader, the only thing I connected in here was Rand and Dragon. Gotcha. That's it. So let's do this. Let's remember this paragraph and tuck it away for later. Okay. Do you want to talk about the sword thing? Or well, is that part of it? That's part of it that he wears a sword. When you sword. say tuck it away for later, like the end of the book? Or like later, later? Later in the series. Oh my. We'll come back to it. What? Yeah. But uh, you wear a sword. I hate it's... waiting. I'm so <laughs> impatient. <laughs> but it, it all ties together, right? The only similarity that we have is that the green man is confused. And the whole point is that Rand's confusion confuses the green man oh. makes him touch his deep fissure in his head yes it does and he's like um i don't I'm know i'm confused it's like caterpillars ate my brain <laughs> when the caterpillars attacked our garden there's holes everywhere the so, slugs the slugs the yeah. slugs this year because of all the rain that's what you're thinking of but yeah. yes caterpillars eat holes too 
caterpillars attacked his brain. Basically is what happened. And now he has dementia. And since he's a plant, it might have been caterpillars. It actually might have been. <laughs> okay, so Rand says, what the fuck are you talking about? And the green man goes, never mind. Yeah, I don't know. My memories are torn and maybe I'm wrong. But no, I'm sure. Oh, well, it's gone. Yeah. No time for that now. <laughs> the computer's starting up. Yeah. So Moraine gets addressed at this point after this whole sort of weird child of the dragon talk. And people. And of people the of the dragon and his clothes and his sword and whatever. So <laughs> Moraine, Sedai, what are you doing here? I've seen you before. This and is that a surprise. Happen. Yeah. This place was made so that none can find it twice. How have you come here? Yeah. Mm, and she just says, need. They have need to see the eye of the world to save the world. But I think we're getting a glimpse of Moraine understanding more about Rand. Okay, go on. Maybe I said that wrong because I think that Moraine has always sort of known about Rand. Yes, okay. And I think that she's careful about what she says and how she says it and who she says it to. Yeah. And the fact that... Like when the, she said to Agelmar, there's a couple of the boys who have the old important. blood. Important. Yeah. <laughs> don't worry about it. Yeah. Just, a, yeah, don't worry. Don't worry about it. We're going to find the, we're going to find the out of the world. Don't Wait, worry. Can, can any of these boys channels? <laughs> uh, uh, anyways, we need to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So she doesn't really seem surprised that the green man has just looked at Rand and said something about the dragon. And she can probably decipher a lot more from these things than... Oh, for sure. Yeah. And it also just clarifies sort of for us that the lens through which the green man sees humans. Okay. Like he looks at Perrin and sees Wolf Brother. He like looks at Rand. Like, I don't know if he sees like faces or if he sees like he sees souls, into like the soul yeah or if he sees impressions of things he doesn't see people and humans the way that other people see them yeah i get like, that he sees like into your soul he yes. basically is looking right through you right and he knows yeah. it's moraine sadai yes like he sees that and he knows the name and knows that she shouldn't be here again yeah, which is interesting to note that the Green Man also understands that you're not supposed to be able to find this place twice because the, the whole reason I bring that up is like the Eye of the World legend, it could have just been that, like a rumor that you can't find it twice. Like yeah. we have no way of knowing, knowing that's a real rule. Except for now. Except for now, the Green Man confirms like this isn't supposed to happen. Right. And so back to my thing about Moraine knowing about Rand. Yeah. I've sort of speculated that she does know he can channel, but knowing that bringing it up now might not bode well for Rand just based on the reaction of either the Red Aja or people knowing men channeling go crazy. Or like Rand himself not dealing with it very well. Well, exactly, right? And <laughs> so. he still doesn't really know what's going on with him. Yeah. And I just think that Moraine is sort of using him. And this goes back to that whole, are I said I going to use you? And, Ooh, okay. Right? Yeah. But I don't think it's for malicious purposes. Yeah, like is it nefarious or not? Exactly. So. I don't think that she's using him for evil or whatever. I think that, yes, she is using him. She understands who he is and what he's capable of and what's going on, especially now with this green man sort of confirming something yeah. about the dragon and Rand, whether it being Rand's the actual dragon reborn or connection to the dragon reborn. Yeah, like how does that even work? And that might be a confirmation for her. Okay. But she's definitely using him the same way that she used Loyal to find the Green Man. Gotcha. And to get through the ways. Like, and to get through the ways. She does use people. Absolutely. But it might not be for the worst reasons. Sure. So I'm still on Team Moraine. Okay. Team Tell Moraine. Team Moraine. And I mean, we could... She's my girl. We could dig into the whole, is it okay to use people even if it's not for malicious reasons? Yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> To use, save the world? Use people all the time to save the world. Absolutely. Sure. All right. Why not? Cool. People are just pawns in my game. Yes. People are pawns in Moraine's game. Ah, yes. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. She's just moving people along. Yeah. Yeah. 
Anyway, so the green man says, so the time has come. He has feared that the dark one stirs and over the years, the blight has been trying harder and harder to come inside. And she just says, we need to see the eye of the world. And he says, come, I will take you. And then the chapter ends. Ooh, big cliffhanger. It's a big one. That's And that's hard for you to not be able to it's read on. It's been a while, yeah. actually. And so I'm excited to read on. We're so close. We're so close that my book can barely stay open because there's <laughs> barely any pages left. Yeah, there's like at nothing. The end. Yeah. yeah. And part of the end of the book is the glossary and part of the great hunt. Yes. Also. So it's like there's very, there's like nothing very left. little left. And you know We're what's so funny? Close. There's so much left though. I know. That too. <laughs> because it's all got to get resolved. Or some actually has to be resolved. I know that you don't know, but I know. And it's good. Good. Yes. I suppose my biggest question is, do you have any speculation on what the eye of the world is? Yeah. Or what's well, I'm happen? picturing Mordor. Okay. But at the same time, I'm also picturing the Wizard of Oz and a guy behind a screen. <laughs> yeah. And a... A projector and yeah. Yes, a hologram okay. of something. So do you think that it's going to be like, like, I don't even know how to ask this. Yeah, I know what you're getting at, especially because you do know. Mm -hmm. So it's hard for you to actually ask me a question. But like, what do I actually picture they're about to head into? Yeah, no idea. No, I haven't even thought about it. I just want to read. Okay. here here's... Uh, here's what I for sure am going to speculate on. I don't think it's an actual literal giant eye. Okay, like an eyeball? Yes. Okay, yeah. Like well, on a pedestal that's like all seeing and all knowing. It's like the eye of the world. Well, some sort Sauron's of like... eye was like literally a big fiery eye ball that looked at things. Yeah. And like that's what I can't help but picture. Okay. But I'm going to clarify that I don't actually think it's, it's an that. eyeball. Okay. 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 It might have to do with a snake. It might be the great serpent. Oh, okay. I like that too. Yeah. It might be like a big snake. Very they interconnected. That they have to like talk to. Ooh, big snake they have to talk to. Parcel tongue. All right. They're going to speak parcel tongue to the great serpent. I have the world. We're going to end this chapter with a shot. Boom. Boom. Congratulations. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. I like that. You know what? I'm okay with that theory. I like that. Okay. Cheers. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. Oh, shoot. The oh other, my God. I'm so part. eager yeah. to end this episode and take this shot. I have cancun mexico and i know that i've done a shot from cancun before but i have more than one shot glass from cancun, from cancun. yeah so it's a different cancun it's a cute one too it's got a little handle yeah and you are repeating this i am is our repeating first yes. repeating shot glass yeah and it is london london england yes cheers cheers <clears throat> I'm kind of happy we snuck that in there. Yeah. Because, you know, this is part of the pattern now. Yeah, it's part of the pattern. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Wheel Weaves. If you're interested in bonus content, cool stickers, shout outs, access to exclusive insider looks, and to support us making great content, you can head over to patreon.com slash the wheel weaves podcast. You can find us on social media where we love interacting with our listeners. We're on Twitter at the wheel weaves podcast and on Instagram at the wheel weaves podcast. You can also join the conversation on our discord channel. There is a channel for no spoilers that I have access to and we also have a spoilers channel that Brett controls so fun for everybody there will be a link on Twitter and also over on our Patreon page you can check that out please feel free to rate comment and subscribe this really does make a huge difference plus if you want to tell a friend about us maybe someone who is just getting into the book series for the first time or other longtime fans who you think would enjoy us word of mouth is the best way for us to reach new listeners and we would take it as a really huge compliment. Thanks, as always, to audionautics.com for the music, and thanks to you awesome listeners.